thank you everyone for uh, for dialing in and uh, thank you so much for the invitation to talk to all of you uh, very excited to, to be here um, I I did my undergrad in Singapore so so you know so Taiwan is, is, is kind of closer to to Singapore than, than where I am now so so you know so I'm, so I'm excited to, to talk to all of you today um, but yeah, so my name's Parvati. I am a planetary scientist at uh, GHU APL in Maryland in the US. Um, and this presentation today is about the origins of water on the moon. So it's a broad topic. And so before I start, you know, I do want to acknowledge that um, because the topic is so broad, most of the work which I'll be talking to you about today um, is not so much my work, but it's the work of many other um, very talented colleagues who I had the pleasure of working with. And most of my own work on the moon um, is supported by NASA through the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Mission, LRO, and also by SURVI, which is the Solar System Exploration Research Virtual Institute. So I want to acknowledge the um, LRO and SURVI teams for, for their support. Um, and in the background here is a side-looking view of the lunar surface taken by one of LRO's cameras. Um, and the crater that you see in the foreground is Cabeus Crater. And so it's somewhere deep within the shadows of Cabeus Crater, which you see here, um, that NASA found the, the first um, strong indications of the presence of water ice. And so we'll, we'll talk more about that today. So I wanted to start by taking a step back and thinking about the, the really big question of, you know, why is this an, an important topic? Why does water on the moon matter so much? Um, so, you know, of course, if you've been thinking about planetary science, um, you will, of course, know that water has been central to some of the really big questions um, in planetary science. Understanding the story of water in the solar system uh, plays such a critical role when it comes to understanding how the ingredients of life got to the Earth-Moon system, um, to our own planet Earth, and to understanding where else in the solar system those ingredients are distributed. So understanding the, uh, the story of water in the solar system has always been a big part of planetary science. But then, you know, why go to the moon to study water? So just as it does in so many other ways, the moon that both the lunar surface and the interior preserve this record of the history of water in the inner solar system, um, and dating all the way back to the earliest days in, in the Earth-Moon system when um, our two neighboring worlds formed. And then, of course, water is essential for, for so much of our human activity. And so part of the interest in lunar water has also come from um, exploring the idea of whether this water could potentially be a resource, whether it's present in um, enough quantities and in a form that we might be able to use it. So that's another reason for the interest uh, in lunar water today. And I did want to say that although I am going to be talking mostly about water today, uh, water is only one of, of several volatile species that are part of the lunar volatile system. And that volatile system has many other components. So from noble gases like helium and argon to alkali metals like sodium and potassium, uh, which I know Rosemary Killen spoke to you about sodium a few talks ago. Um, and every single one of those volatiles um, has its, its own interesting story to tell. And so we're focusing on water today, um, but it is just one of those many volatiles, each of which has its own fascinating story. And so water has been present throughout the history of the Earth-Moon system in a variety of different forms, and it could have been delivered by a variety of different sources. So based on our current understanding, we think that water was present um, during the early days of the Earth-Moon system, at the time of moon formation. And in fact, the question of just how much water was present um, all those four and a half billion years ago is still something that is a topic of active research. But then after the Earth and Moon formed separately, um, the surface of the Moon 
has been bombarded by asteroids and comets for from many billions of years ago all the way to to the present day and many of those asteroids and comets may have delivered water to the lunar surface from about 3.8 billion years ago to 1 billion years ago the moon underwent a period of widespread global volcanism and um, there's been a recent renewed realization that during that era of volcanism, when magma rose from the depths of the moon to the surface, it carried with it volatiles, including water, and released those to the lunar surface. And some of those volatiles and some of that water may be preserved in some places on the surface today. And then even in the present day, when the moon appears to be quiet, um, the story of water is, is still not complete. The moon is constantly bombarded by the solar wind, by hydrogen ions streaming from the sun, and that hydrogen can react with oxygen in the surface to form H2O. Um, that H2O can be mobilized when micrometeoroids impact the surface. And so the water cycle continues even today in, in a slightly different form than it was in the past. Um, and today, water is present not just on the lunar surface, it's also present in the interior of the moon, it's bound up in the rocks, um, and it's also present in the exosphere um, in small quantities, that thin atmosphere that surrounds the moon. Um, so we'll talk about all three of those today. And I also want to emphasize that, you know, this is a story that's relatively new. Our understanding of water on the moon has really undergone transformational changes just over the last 10 years. Um, one of the reasons it's, it's such an exciting topic to work on is that there are still so many questions that we don't yet have have answers to and you know those are always the, the best science questions the ones that we haven't figured out completely yet and so let's begin with primordial water so this is the 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 oldest form of water in in the moon it's the water that's present mostly in the lunar interior so for many decades after the Apollo missions returned lunar samples to, to the Earth and, you know, as um, our colleagues who do lab analysis looked at the, those rocks, the, the sort of prevailing wisdom was that the interior of the moon was, was relatively dry, that the giant impact that formed the moon was, was so energetic that um, it vaporized all of that water and all of that water was, was lost to space. So that was the view until around 10 years ago. Um, when, again, our colleagues who do lab analysis began to look at these samples with some of the advanced instrumentation that had been developed over the decades since those samples came back to Earth. And what they found was that with those advanced instruments, um, there were fairly significant, small but significant quantities of water inside some of those lunar samples. And that kind of changed our view um, of the lunar interior. It turned out that the interior of the moon may not be as dry um, as we once thought it was. And the picture became even more interesting because when you look at samples from different regions of the moon, those have different amounts of water. So, the, so water content might actually vary um, within the interior of the moon. And there's an excellent review paper uh, by Katie Robinson and uh, Jeff Taylor that I've linked to here. And so our picture has, has evolved. We now think that there may have been some water present during the time the moon formed that survived that event and was incorporated into the interior of the moon. And then in the, in the early um, 100 million years or so, um, after the moon formed, when the earth and moon were, were still accreting, um, volatiles may also have been delivered to the earth moon system by impactors, by comets and asteroids. Um, and by looking at the isotopic ratios of water within those samples, um, the, the consensus these days, and, and this is not something I'm personally an expert in, but the consensus um, among the people who do this work seems to be that the water is mostly asteroidal, based mostly by analyzing the isotopic ratios and thinking about how things might mix during these early stages of accretion. And so maybe comets, the icy bodies of the outer solar system contributed a smaller quantity, but mostly um, the signature of water inside the moon seems to be one of asteroids. I wanted to um, take uh, a moment and take a slide to, to talk about samples because much of, um, much of what we know about the 
the earliest parts of the story of water on the moon comes from analysis of these samples. So for instance, this picture here shows volcanic green glass beads found in this otherwise quite plain looking rock. Um, this is Apollo sample 15426. Um, and so these volcanic beads formed when magma erupted into vacuum, it cooled extremely quickly, uh, forming these glasses that trapped inside them some of the water that was present in the magma. And so um, the instruments we have today make it possible to analyze samples like those and, and piece um, th that story together. And something, and this is a story, you know, even though those samples are, are several decades old at this point, um, and of course they're even older in, in in, in terms of geological time, um, sample analysis is, is still uncovering new parts of the story. So for instance, recently, um, earlier this year and, and last, um, NASA uh, opened for the first time some samples that had been set aside because we knew that 50 years later, there would be new instrumentation to look at these samples. So this story is, is one that is still continuing today. Um, and so these questions of when was the water delivered to the, uh, the water inside the moon? Does it all date back to the very beginning? Did it come in later from comets and asteroids? Um, how is it distributed? Where is, is the water concentrated? Is it sort of uniformly mixed inside the moon or do some parts have more water than, than others? And, and how much water is there inside the moon? We know uh, the moon is much drier, of course, than Earth, but, but how much water is there in the interior? All of those um, are still active research questions. And so we have this water that, that's trapped within rocks, small quantities, trace quantities that we can look at with, um, ad, with advanced lab techniques. Um, but there are some parts of the lunar surface where water can be present in a very different form and in a more recognizable form um, as, as water ice. Uh, and so these are the permanently shadowed regions. So because of the way that the spin axis of the moon is oriented as it orbits the sun. Um, near the north and south poles of the moon, the sun is always extremely low in, in the sky. It's always very low on the horizon. And as a result, any kind of topography, any crater walls or peaks cast very long, very dark shadows. Uh, and in fact, there are some regions, the, the permanently shadowed regions, uh, which have not seen sunlight for over 2 billion years. You can see some of those shadowed regions in this visible light image here. Uh, and some of those regions, if you look to the right, to this map of, of the average temperature, some of those regions, because they've been insulated from um, or, or shadowed from sunlight for so long, have some of the coldest temperatures in the solar system, really frigid temperatures. Here's a temperature scale in Kelvin. And the special thing about those temperatures is that when you get to temperatures that cold, um, you reach a point at which many of these otherwise volatile ices can remain thermally stable for billions of years over geological timescales. So for instance, when we get down to average temperatures of around 100 Kelvin, which you can see in the blues on this temperature map, water can remain stable for billions of years. Um, at even lower temperatures, you, you get um, more of a variety of compounds. And the L-Cross mission, which we'll talk about in a bit, probed one of those very coldest spots, which, which I've marked with a star here. And so before we talk about the origin of water at the poles, um, the more fundamental question is, well, what exactly is there? And so since the late 1990s, there have been several orbital missions that have tried to, uh, to piece together the answer to that question. Um, and there are still many things that we don't know about the abundance, distribution, and physical form of water ice at the lunar poles. But here are some of the things that we do know. By looking at um, maps of neutron suppression, like this one that I'm, I'm pointing to, um, we can get an indication of how much hydrogen there is in the subsurface. Now, we don't know if it's H2O um, or if it's something else, but, it's, but we can get a sense of how much hydrogen is in the upper meter or so of the surface. And so this map is colorized um, according to hydrogen abundance. And so these regions that are blue closer to the poles, we know that there is more hydrogen present in some form beneath the surface. We also have 10 years of spectroscopic measurements. 
um, from the LRO mission and from other international missions that have flown. And by looking at that spectroscopic data, um, we can look for spectral signatures of water ice. And so these little blue dots that you see in some places on these maps are places where um, several of the data sets seem to suggest that there are small exposures of surface ice, small patches of ice at the very uppermost surface. Um, and so this is data that comes from some of these instruments along the bottom here. M cubed is an infrared instrument, which looks for absorption bands of water in the infrared. LOLA is a laser, so it shines a laser and looks for regions that are brighter, maybe due to the presence of water ice. Um, and then we, we also um, have Diviner, which has mapped the surface temperature of the moon, and LAMP, which is an ultraviolet instrument, which is sensitive to um, ultraviolet features of, of H2O. Um, and these are just some of the spots where all of those measurements agree. There are some other regions where things get even more interesting, where if you look at the infrared observations, it looks like maybe there's water present, but if you look at the ultraviolet, maybe uh, you don't see anything there. So, so piecing these observations together is, is very, it's a very non-trivial problem. And then of course we have this one ground truth measurement um, at Cabeas Crater. So the L Cross mission um, emptied out its fuel tank and then it dropped that tank um, into the shadows here where it kicked up a cloud of debris of dust and ice um, that the camera was able to see both in visible light and to look at with, um, uh, with spectral instruments. And it detected not just H2O, but, but a whole variety of, of other compounds as well. And so even though this information is incomplete, we can begin to place together um, the story of, you know, how, how, did, how did the lunar poles come to uh, be what they are today? And this is a really interesting problem because the different sources that might have delivered that water to the poles have varied through time. So if you look at the, uh, the dashed and dotted lines here, you can see that impactors, one potential source of water, um, the impact flux has steadily declined over time. Uh, the volcanic flux had two notable peaks um, at around 3.8 and 3.5 billion years ago. So you can see those peaks in volcanism here and then it slowly died down and the moon, uh, you know, the magma solidified, the moon reached its present day state. Um, and this is a figure from a paper by Ariel Deutsch um, and marked on this plot, so you can see the varying sources, you can also see a few different craters. Um, and so in this paper, Ariel looked at uh, craters which have ice and craters which have no ice. Um, and you can see that this is, this is a little bit of a puzzle. Even you have craters of the same age some of them have water ice, some of them don't have water ice. Why is that? This is something we're still actively trying to understand, but there are some interesting ideas out there. Um, one idea is that we know that the moon's orbit um, and spin may have varied in the past. And so there may be some craters which are very cold today, but perhaps during the time um, that water was delivered, perhaps those craters weren't so cold after all. Um, also, the moon today has no magnetic field, but it may have had a global magnetic field at some point in the past. And one uh, very recent idea that people have just begun to explore is maybe the presence of that magnetic field influenced the amount of water um, that could be produced by the solar wind and, and how it might be distributed. So lots of interesting ideas there. And so how do we figure out where these polar volatiles came from. Um, there are a few different things we can look at. And again, we don't have all of the information, but here are some of the directions we could go in. Uh, composition can be an important clue. So for instance, looking at the measurements made by that L-cross impact, um, you see a range of compounds that suggest that maybe uh, comets or asteroids may have played a role. We see some things that look like they could have come from comets or asteroids. But if we look at how much of those things are present, um, in addition to water, it looks like, you know, maybe there has been some chemistry within those cold traps over those billions of years as well. Volcanic gases. If we look at what else is present along with water, 
we might um, get a sense of where that water could have come from. So for instance, volcanic gases are mostly carbon monoxide and sulfur compounds. And so if we see those in addition to water, maybe that's a sign that volcanism may have played a major role. And then there's the solar wind, which we'll talk about in a bit more detail, but the solar wind may have a very different isotopic ratio compared to some of these other sources. It's also important to understand, you know, not just where did the water initially come from, but how did it get to the poles? Um, and so this is something, this is one of the things that I work on, uh, together with many others who, who run models of, of different kinds. Um, and so it's important to think about some of these questions, you know, how, how does water get to the polar coal traps? And that may have been different at different points in time. So today the moon has a very thin exosphere. Um, it's, you know, a, a million billion times less dense than the atmosphere of, of Earth. But at some point in the past, maybe after a comet impact or maybe after a volcanic eruption, the moon may have had a slightly thicker atmosphere, still very thin compared to those of some other planets, but perhaps there was more of an atmosphere. And, what ha and how does water get transported when you have an atmosphere rather than a thin exosphere? Um, that's a topic of, of, uh, of much interest as well. So for instance, one of the things that the second paper on this, look, this looks at by Alexey Bereshnoy um, is, well, what kind of chemistry might you get if you have an atmosphere that's created by a comet impact, maybe the water can react with other things so that what you end up with at the poles um, is an interesting mixture of compounds. And then of course, even after water is deposited at the poles, it undergoes alteration processes. You, 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 you know, so you're, you're looking at a book that has been written over, over billions of years by, by many different people and, 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 and trying to, to understand it. So even after water is deposited, um, impact gardening happens. You have small impactors that break up the ice. You have energetic particles that uh, can, can alter those ices uh, and maybe drive chemistry. And all of those may have played important roles. So this is really a story of, you know, trying to understand the language that this, this story is, is written in. And so the, that's that's the that's the polar volatile story, which at the moment there are definitely more questions there than answers. But the water cycle is something that is still active today. Um, the moon sits exposed to the solar wind, and so that stream of hydrogen uh, ions, protons coming from the solar wind, can combine with oxygen in the lunar regolith to form OH. And under some temperature conditions. Um, if there's enough energy available, OHs can combine to form H2O. Um, and we think that this might be perhaps the most active current source of water on the lunar surface. And it's something that we think we might see in some of these infrared and ultraviolet observations. So I know Amanda Hendricks is going to be talking to you today um, about the ultraviolet observations in detail. This map here is constructed from infrared observations. Um, from, from the M-cubed um, instrument, which, which you might hear, um, hear more about. But this is a map that shows you, that looks for the absorption feature um, diagnostic of the oxygen-hydrogen bond. Um, and by looking at how strong that absorption band is, um, Lee and Milliken did, did some um, clever work to, to figure out how much uh, water there might be present at different latitudes. And so you can see that there's some very, some interesting uh, variations here. Um, and we think that much of this water, um, you know, it might be H2O, it might be OH, uh, but we think that this is, is largely something that is created on an ongoing basis by the solar wind. And then there are also micrometeoroids. Um, we see micrometeoroid showers light up our night sky. Um, those micrometeoroids also help the surface of the moon. Um, and micrometeoroids are interesting because, you know, there, there may be small amounts of water present within the micrometeoroids themselves, but the real role that micrometeoroids play is to heat the surface. So, for instance, if you look at this uh, laboratory micrometeoroid impact, you can see that an impactor that's only this big um, heats and shocks the surface all around it. You can see how the, the metal has been bent by the, the force of that impact. And so by, 
supplying that energy to the lunar surface, micrometeoroids can kick up water. And in fact, there was an orbital mission, the LADEE mission, uh, which orbited the moon around the equator and found that every now and then you would see these spikes of water. So these, these white spikes that you see in this graph. And the interesting thing was that every single one of those spikes corresponded to a different micrometeoroid shower. So we have a good idea of when these micrometeoroid streams hit the moon. And Laddie found that those micrometeoroid streams almost always coincide with peaks in the detection of water, which indicates that micrometeoroids, whenever they hit the surface, are releasing water from the surface, water that might have, um, you know, they may be supplying energy for OH to combine and form H2O. So that's the, the water cycle, but we also see um, different forms of water on the lunar surface. There's water that is locked up within minerals and locked up within rocks, um, and it exists beyond the poles, in fact, quite near the equator in some places. And so these are a few examples of, of those um, special regions. So for instance, uh, in this figure here is a volcanic vent, um, and Red on this color bar indicates that there's something that is very rich in, in uh, OH, um, so perhaps OH, perhaps H2O. And so we think that these red regions might be regions where there are some volcanic beads that, that are water rich scattered around that vent. Um, here's a crater. If you look at that crater in the infrared, the crater peak seems to contain H2O, so trapped within the rock, but H2O that might have been uh, brought up from deep within the moon. And then you have uh, this quite beautiful region, the, the Reiner Gamma Swirl, um, which, which shows up you know, quite, quite beautifully in, in, this, uh, in this OH absorption map. Um, and so Reiner Gamma is one of several magnetic anomalies. So even though the moon doesn't have a global magnetic field today, um, it has localized magnetic fields. So it's almost as if there's a magnet sitting under the surface at Reiner Gamma. And when you have a magnetic field, it tends to deflect um, H plus ions coming from the sun so that in regions where you have a strong magnetic field, you have less OH and less H2O being formed. So water exists in a number of different flavors and some of them get very interesting indeed. And then... Looking to the future, there is perhaps an unusual source of lunar water. Um, spacecraft, whenever a spacecraft slows down to land on the lunar surface, it fires its engines, um, it burns its fuel, and often when a spacecraft burns fuel, it releases gases, including H2O. Um, and now that amount of water is, is usually quite small compared to the other sources. So, so the, the picture here is uh, from some simulations that I ran recently, looking at how much water vapor would be released by a spacecraft. Um, you know, how does it expand into space and fall back? Um, and, and the amount involved is, is fairly small, but it's important because when you're planning a mission to perhaps go and study water on the moon, um, it's, it's important, it's something to keep at the back of your mind that, hey, there may be some water that comes not from the moon, but but from the spacecraft, um, and so so that so this is you know potentially um, another small but depending on what kind of measurements you're making, maybe significant source of lunar water. And so, looking ahead, um, this is my final slide before some references. Um, but the the story of water on the moon it's it's about the past, the present, and the future of the moon. It's something um, that's not just important in terms of understanding the moon, but also to understanding other places um, in, the in the solar system. The moon um, it has recorded the history of our solar system neighborhood uh, in ways that nowhere, uh, in, in ways that have been erased on Earth. And the moon is also a, such a great laboratory for understanding how physics and chemistry work in strange environments. Um, and what makes this such a rich area to, to work in and such an exciting area to work in is the fact that there are still so many mysteries. Um, and there are many, many missions um, and ideas out there for measurements that can be made, both from orbit and from the surface. 
um, computational models, lab experiments, all of these different kinds of science have a role to play in putting that story together. So the image on the background here is of the illuminated rim of Shackleton Crater, which is a permanently shattered crater at the lunar south pole. So everything that's black um, in, in this image is actual area that is in permanent darkness. Um, and I think it's almost a metaphor for the story of lunar water. We, you know, we, we've only illuminated a small portion of that story um, and there's, there's so much more um, left to discover. And so in the next few slides, um, I included a, a, a few references. Um, one of the first links here is to a white paper that I wrote with many other colleagues recently. We had to summarize recent developments in seven pages. So if you want a, a seven page, very brief summary of everything that's happened over the last 10 years, um, I, I recommend this white paper. And these papers, of course, go into much more detail. I've also included a few useful tools here that might be useful if you want to look at some of the data sets and learn more about the samples. Um, and here's, here's my APL fleet chart, uh, which just shows all of APL's missions across the solar system. Um, I just put it in there so you can see some of the stuff that other people I work with get up to. Um, but with that, um, that's all I have for you today. And so, you know, so, so I hope um, I, I got you a little bit as excited about lunar water as I am. And I don't know if we have time for questions, but um, if we do, I'm happy to answer questions. And of course, my email is on these slides. So feel free to, to reach out to me anytime as well.